All right, hello everyone, and welcome to part one of the Math 1813 final exam review. I'm just gonna jump right into it. So question one, we have this function shown in this graph here, and we need to find if the average rate of change between these two intervals is positive or negative. So average rate of change, we typically associate with like the slope of a function. So is it increasing or decreasing? So let's look at our first interval. We have negative one to zero. So negative one is going to be right here, and zero is going to be right here. And so as you can see between these two lines, it's decreasing. So we have that negative slope. So that means that one's going to be negative. What about four to five? Four is going to be about right here. Five is going to be about right here. And this line is going upwards, so it has that. It's increasing, so it's going to have a positive slope or a positive average rate of change. All right, and then part C we want to find the interval that has the smallest average rate of change. So it's smallest means it needs to be either the most negative or the smallest positive value. So let's first check and see if there are any negative values and then out of the negative ones we can find the most negative. So negative 5 to negative 4, all right, well this one still has a positive slope there. So that one probably won't be our answer unless we don't have any negatives, but let's keep going. Negative four to negative three. Well, we have negative four here, negative three here. It's still positive, still an increasing, um, still increasing, so got another positive there. Negative three to negative two, it's still positive, still increasing. And then negative two, negative one. Let me erase some of this. Negative 2 is going to be up here. Negative 1 is going to be right here. This is a decreasing, um, or the part of this function is decreasing. And so that's going to have a negative slope or a negative average rate of change. And so for the smallest, smallest in this case, the smallest is going to be the negative value. So D is going to be our answer here. All right, question 2. So we know that f of 8 minus f of 5 over 8 minus 5 is less than 0. So that means that this value is negative. And we want to select the following that must be true. So one thing I want to point out, 8 minus 3, is, or sorry, 8 minus 5 is 3, and 3 is a positive value. So for this whole term right here to be negative, that means that the top has to be negative. So f of 8 minus f of 5 is going to be less than zero. Well, what happens if we move that f of 5 to the other side? So if we add f of 5 to both sides, we get this here, or we can write it this way, right? And we're just flipping those around. So we get that f of 5 is greater than f of 8. So it's basically saying that if f of 8 minus f of 5 is negative, that means f of 8 has to be smaller. So that's one of our answers. Now let's look at the rest. So B is saying that F is decreasing on this interval. Well, it's decreasing if our average rate of change or the slope on this interval is negative. Well, notice that what we're actually given here, this F of eight minus F of five over three, is our change in Y's over change in X's, or the Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, which is our slope formula. So if this value is negative, then that means it is decreasing. So B is going to be one of our answers there. Uh, so we know D is not going to be correct since we know A is. And then we have C, we have F of 8 is negative. But we don't know that for sure. Our F of 8 and F of 5 can be positive values even though the slope between them is decreasing or negative. Um, and same thing with part E for F of 5 is positive. That's not necessarily true. Um, all we know here is that f of 8 is a smaller value, so it could be either more negative or a smaller positive number compared to f of 5. The signs, we don't actually know. It can't be guaranteed here. All we know from this statement here is the slope. So our answers for this one is just going to be a and b. On to question 3. So we have this table where n is the number of donuts and c is the cost. All right, and so we want to find the average rate of change and the cost for each of the given intervals, different values, all right? So we know the formula we're going to follow is going to be our y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, or a change in y's over change in x's. All right, so this first one here, we're going to have, um, so we have 100 to 200. So on the bottom, we're going to have 200 minus 100. 
and then the top is going to be the value at 200 minus the value at 100. So it's going to be 123 minus 74. And plugging that into your calculator will give you 0.49. Alright? And then we just follow a similar process for the rest. So we're going to have 250 minus 200 on the bottom. 250, we have 147.5. For 200, again, we have 123. And that's also going to give us 0.49. And then lastly, 400 minus 250, 400 gives us 221, 250 gives us 147.50, and that one, again, gives us 0.49. So what you notice here is we have the same slope between each of these intervals, so that means that we're going to have a constant slope or a constant rate of change. And this will be useful for part B when we're finding a formula as a linear function. So a linear function has a constant slope and then a y-intercept, right? So all we need now that we have the slope is a point, and we can use this y minus y1 equals m, our slope, x minus x1, to solve for that equation. And actually, our x in this case, I'm going to rewrite that in terms of our variables here. Our x in this case is n, our c is our y, so I'm going to do c minus c1 equals m n minus n1 all right i'm gonna just take this first point here um, but you should get the same answer regardless of which point you use since we do have that constant slope so let's just start filling in c minus 74 equals 0 0.49 n minus 100 all right here we go I'm going to add that 74 to both sides, so we're going to get 0 0.49 n minus 100 plus 74, and then distributing that 0.49, and then, so this is going to be uh, minus 49, so we're going to get minus 49 plus 74, and that's going to give us plus 25. So this is our function here. We have the cost is equal to 0.49 times the number of donuts plus $25. Question four gives us another formula. Instead of a table though, we just have the actual function. Um, this represents the amount of money in dollars in an account at T years. And so we want to first find the average rate of change in this account between the years um, T equals zero and T equals five. All right, so we're going to have a of five minus a of zero over five minus zero. So our a of t is gonna be 150 e to the 0 0.1 and then times our five, bring that over again. Well, this is gonna be zero here. Five minus zero is just gonna be five. Well, if we have the zero here, we're gonna get e to the zero power, which is just gonna be one. So that's going to give us 150 e to the 0 0.5 minus 150 over 5. And then after plugging that into your calculator, we want to round to two decimal places. So we're going to get roughly 19.46 there. And that's going to be in dollars, right? Because A is in dollars. And since it's the average rate of change, we have dollars over years. So it's actually going to be 19 46 dollars per year and then the next part wants us to explain the average rate of change in practical terms so this means that all right so a represents the amount of money in the account so the amount of money in the account and then so the change here, so it's going to be growing since it's a positive amount, grew $19.46 each year. And remember, this is an average rate of change, so we want to specify on average over, well, our range of time here is five years, so over the first five years the money was in the account okay. 
So we started at t equals zero, so the very start of having that account, the money in the account, and then we went over the first five years. So there we go. Question five, we have Mr. Green has a small water garden pond, which he's filling with water, and initially had some water in it due to rain the previous night. And Mr. Green's water faucet is filling it at a rate of 2.5 gallons per minute. We also know that in five minutes, the pond has 13.7 gallons of water in it, and we wanna find how much was in it initially. So we have this constant rate here, this 2.5 gallons per minute, and this gallons per minute is gonna be important. Just in terms of units, Okay, what, well, what else do we know? We know that in five minutes, we have 13.7 gallons. So we don't initially know how much um, the pond initially had, how much water the pond initially had, but we can find that since we know um, the rate, so that average rate of change that it's growing by, as well as the amount at a certain time. So typically we have this y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. If we can fill this in and get it in terms of say y equals mx plus b, well b here is our initial amount or our y intercept and so that is the number we're looking for. So let's plug in what we have and see if we can get it to that point. So our y is the amount of water, so we're going to keep that, but we know that there's 13.7 gallons whenever x is equal to 5. Our m here is 2.5, and we want to notice that it's gallons per minute, and our time is also in 5 minutes, so we know those are matched up. So then we're going to have that there. All right, I'm going to add 13.7 to both sides. And then let's distribute that out. So we're going to get... It's going to be minus... 12.5 plus 13.7. All right, and then lastly, adding these two values together, we're going to get y is equal to 2.5x plus 1.2. This is our function. And so remember, we want to know how many gallons of water were in the pond initially. So that's going to be 1.2 gallons. That b there, that plus b, or that y-intercept is also that initial amount, so that's how we know that 1.2 gallons is what we want. All right, question six gives us three different functions and they want us to solve for the domain for each one. So one helpful piece of information here would just be knowing the domain for some of these base functions. So for example, we have polynomials, we have square roots, we have rationals, and we have logs. So we'll just go one by one. So part A, all we have is a polynomial. There's nothing else happening here. Polynomial just means, well, this is a quadratic, right? So we have this x squared term and nothing else, nothing weird in there as well. Well, the domain for polynomials is always going to be all reals. So an interval notation is going to be negative, sorry, negative infinity to positive infinity. However, part B is a little bit more complicated. So we actually have two things here that we need to look at that's going to exclude values from our domain. So one thing, we know we have the square root here, so we need to have the value underneath the square root cannot be negative, so cannot be negative. So we'll need to exclude any value of x that makes the root negative. And then down here, well, we can't divide by zero, so it cannot be zero. So we know, well, we, if we have x plus one equals zero, x is going to be negative 1, and so we want to exclude negative 1 from our, our interval. So that's one value. And then now let's look at the square root. Well, we need x plus 5 to be greater than or equal to 0. So that means that we need x to be greater than or equal to negative 5. So we need all values greater than or equal to negative 5. Um, and that does include negative 1, so we'll also need to make sure to exclude negative 1 from our final inter interval. So let's start writing that out. We're going to start at negative 5. We're going to include every value except for negative 1. And then all of the positives above that. Those were, will work fine. So there's our answer for that one. And finally, part C, we have this logarithmic function. Well, the domain for a typical log, so log of x, is always going to be the inside, or x in this case, 
has to be greater than zero. So that means the inside of our function, x plus five, has to be greater than zero. Well, subtracting five from both sides, we get x has to be greater than negative five. So our domain here is gonna be negative five all the way to positive infinity. And there we go. Question seven gives us this graph over here. And then they want us to find domain range and then also intervals of increase and decrease. So let's start off with domain. Domain is associated with our x value. So we need to find every value of x um, included in this curve, this line here. So notice that the most left x we have is negative 6 excluded. And then the rightmost is negative 6, sorry, 0 included. So we're going to have an open parenthesis on the negative 6 and then 0 with a bracket, a closed bracket there since we're including it. All right, so as for the range, we're going to look from bottom to top. So our lowest value here is going to be negative 6. Our highest value is going to be up here, and y equals 2. And we're going to include both of those points. This point here is the only one that's open. The rest of the points on the curve are included. All right, now let's look at increasing and decreasing intervals. So increasing means there's going to be a positive slope. So it's going to have a positive slope all the way up to this point here, right? And then negative, so it's going down here. So up here, going down on the other side. So increasing, we're still going to exclude the negative 6 since it's not included in our line. Um, but then we're going to go negative 6 and then up to negative 4. But we don't want to include negative 4 in this interval as well. The slope at the top here is actually zero. It's not increasing or decreasing. It's not positive or negative. So we're gonna keep that as an open bracket as well. And then decreasing, we're gonna start at negative four as it starts decreasing and go all the way to zero there. Question eight gives us a table of values of x and f of x, and then they want us to solve for the formula of a quadratic function. So this Telling us that it's a quadratic function here means that our f of x is going to follow some form a is some constant or coefficient, and then we're going to have two x's as well as two zeros. So to fill in those first, we need to find two values of x where f of x equals zero. So what are x's where f of x equals zero? Well, we can use a table for that. So f of x equals 0 here and here. So that means that negative 5 is going to be a 0 and 6 is also going to be a 0. So negative 5 is going to give us positive 5 here and then 6 here. And then the last thing we need to do is use some other point to solve for a. So we have three leftover points here that we can use. I'm going to use this one here just because the 0 is a little easier to work with. But you should be able to find the same answer. Um, with, one, with one of the other two points. So that means f of x is going to be negative 15. Solving for a, and we're going to get 0 plus 5, 0 minus 6. It's going to come out to 5 times negative 6, or negative 30. Divide both sides by negative 30, and we're going to get a is equal to... The negatives cancel out, and this comes out to 1 half. So our final answer here, our f of x, is going to be 1 half, and then our zeros factored out form, just like that. And there we go. Question 9, they want us to write formulas for the price P of a gallon of gas in T days if the price on day T equals 0 is $2. And then they're giving us different rates, so we've got linear rates and then exponential rates as well. All right, so... For part A, we said it's increasing by three cents per day. So this per day constant value means it's going to be a linear function. So if it's linear, this means that $2, a t equals zero, is gonna be our B value. So we're gonna get P is equal to 0.03t plus two. B, however, gives us 2% per day. So when we have this percent here, it means we're going to have an exponential function. Now, since it doesn't say continuous, that means we're most likely going to be using this a, b to the t formula. 
Well, our initial amount, our A, is still 2, so we're going to get 2 times our B, or our 1 plus our rate. Well, it's going to give us 2 times 1.02 to the T. So we're adding that 0.02 because it's increasing by 2%. Remember, we have this A, AB to the T is equal to A1 plus R to the T. And so that's what we're using here. C gives us a decrease by 4%. So that means that our rate is going to be negative 0.04. It's negative because it's decreasing. So we're going to get P is equal to, keep our initial value to, 1 plus our negative 0.04. So that's going to give us, let me erase that actually. So we know that our rate is negative 0.04. So we're going to get P is equal to 2 times 1 minus 0.04, which is the same as 0.96 to the T. So that's going to be our formula there. And then finally, part D and E specifies continuous rate. So that means we're going to use the form AE to the RT. So again, our initial value is still going to be 2, so that's not changing. The only difference here is our continuous rate is this R here. So this is going to be, well, since it's increasing, it's going to be positive, so 0.03t. And then finally for D, similar form, but we have a decreasing rate. So we're going to get P is equal to 2e to the negative 0.05t. And there we go. So we just got to pick up the difference in um, wording and notation for these problems. If we have increasing by a constant amount per day, it's going to be linear. If it's a percentage without specifying continuous, then you're going to use this form here. If it does specify continuous with that percentage rate, then you're going to use this form here. There you go.